Well, good evening, church. And a welcome to the mid-service of our weekly prayer time. Uh, time is flowing by. All right, so let me just get right into it. I don't have the luxury as I normally do. Okay, this evening, um, I'm going to be addressing the subject of the promises of godliness. The promises of godliness, and I'll be dealing with B, the B part of uh, 1 Timothy 4, the 8th verse. Last night, our elder James very eloquently dealt with the A part, so I'm going to be doing the B part this evening. Here begin the reading of God's word. And the B part I'll just focus on says, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Having promise. I think in addition to what was said last night by Elder James, which I think she eloquently went through um, godliness, I thought it would be good for me personally, and perhaps you may consider it to be good for you as well, if we all have our concept, our concept of what godliness is. Now, to me, godliness is having a reverent awareness and recognition and regard for God's sovereignty over every aspect of my life. And in addition to that, I myself personally have to have the determination right, that I am going to do the will of God or honor God in everything that I do. That is my personal concept of of godliness. And I think it will be good for each of us, if you want um, Elder James's uh, several minutes, she, she gave just a wonderful idea of godliness. But for me personally, I think everyone individually has to internalize what, what you feel about godliness. We know that God does not listen to sinners. This is what the Apostle John says in John, the ninth chapter, verses 31. I don't know if you really realize that. I think sometimes you have to remind people. God does not, and, when I, and I haven't read this verse for a long time, but when I read it, I said, just look at that. God, we know that God does not listen to sinners. But get this. But if anyone is a worshiper of God, and does his will, he hears them. Did you realize that verse was in the Bible? If you have to be a true worshiper, as one of the things that I appreciate about our pastor, that she leads in this regard. We don't realize just how privileged it is to be able to have the freedom to worship God. Worshiping God, being a worshiper, is part and an integral part of, of godliness. If you consider yourself to be a godly person, then you need to be a true worshiper of God. So I think it's useful for us to understand these things as we go through this whole idea of godliness. The Holy Spirit provides us, as Elder James mentioned last night, with the power for a godly life. You cannot live a godly life without the power of the Holy Spirit. If you try to do it on your own, you will be frustrated and you will fail. Peter asks the question in Acts. He says, why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? Peter had to remind him that it wasn't by our power. It wasn't on our own strength that we made this man walk. It was by the power of the Holy Spirit. Grace teaches us that to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live a self-controlled and upright and godly lives in this present world while we wait for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, that is mentioned over in Titus 2, 12, verses 12 to 13. Looking at this portion here now, B, or verse 8, having promise of the life that now is. In Matthew 7, 21, it says, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. A very important part of godliness. Doing the will of God 
as you see it within your life. Having promise of the life that now is. In other words, godliness gives us and makes a way for the promise or whatever is really necessary for us in this life. We ask for things, but sometimes we are not always operating in godliness and operating according to the will of God. There is nothing which we really need in this life which is not promise by the word of God. David, near the close of a long life, was able to bear this remarkable testimony on this subject. He says, I have been young. And now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Boy, I love to get into that, but i got to move on. I believe that if we are not rooted and grounded in godliness in this life, we will constantly be buffeted about by ungodliness. Do you realize that ungodliness can affect you and can influence you if you are not grounded and rooted in God's way? Sometimes we go into a situation and we think that we can handle it. But we all have human nature. David says in uh, Psalms 37, very important passage of scripture regarding this whole subject of godliness. He says in Psalm 37 and verses 1 to 6, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Verse 5, commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noonday. We should never envy evil people. Okay, you see people who have money, who have riches, who have position. Don't envy, don't envy that. Because that is all temporary. We are now preparing ourselves for what? For the second coming of Jesus Christ, for the kingdom of God. We who follow God live differently from the wicked. We should live differently from the wicked. And our treasure should be in heaven. To commit ourselves to the Lord means entrusting everything, our lives, families, jobs, possessions, to his control and guidance. It also means that we believe that God can care for us better than we can care for ourselves. I have to move on. I'm sorry. God extends his kindness on us in this world in order that he may give us only a foretaste. When God is good to you, he is giving you a foretaste of what he has prepared for you. So don't grow weary. Don't become discouraged. No matter what you are going through, remember, God is watching over you. I believe that the essential benefits of godliness can be manifested in this present life in three areas. A healthy body, and Elder James touched on that. If you look at people who are living ungodly lives, they're all addicted. They have addictions, alcohol, drugs, or whatever. And those things take their toll on your life. But if you are living a godly life, you're, you're away from that. You're free from that. And you have health benefits. Health benefits come with that. God honors that. Also, a happy home. You can see the benefits of godliness in the home. Is nothing, is nothing more discouraging than being in a home where there's nothing but turmoil and fighting and arguing and fussing. And then thirdly, a clean conscience and a holy heart. When you are godly, you have a clean conscience because you are trying to do everything according to the will of God in your life. And the second, the second part of that be, and of that which is to come, eternal life. Godliness is, only, is the only thing that promises such a life. We have to live godly life. Godliness shows God that you really want to be with him. And you really delight in him. And you want to be with him for all eternity. That, that, that sends a signal to him that you really want to, you're looking forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's what godliness, that's the message that godliness sends to God. Sin promises pleasures in the present life but only to disappoint us in the end. 
Sin makes no promise of happiness in the future world. Sin will not be tolerated or exist when God comes and establishes his kingdom. How can we go about establishing and cultivating godliness? We must pray as we are doing this week. We must pray to God, communicate to God, and, and petition God. We must change what we consider to be valuable in this life. Isn't it sad that people who are supposed to be spiritual put so much value and so much work and so much thought and so much worry on the temporal things? These things will pass away. People are truly saved only as they believe in Christ as their Savior. And finally, in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, it is said, But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Sometimes that gets crowded out with the things that we are dealing with right now. But we can't even imagine what God has in store for us. So godliness is something that is like having a, you're investing in that future for eternal life. It's an investment that we make in eternal life. We cannot imagine all that God has in store for us, both in this life and for eternity. He will create a new heaven and a new earth, and we will live with him forever. Until then, the Holy Spirit comforts and guides us daily knowing the wonderful and eternal future that awaits us, gives us hope and courage to press on in this life. Don't give up no matter what you are going through. Remember that it's not going to always be this way. It won't be this, it will not always be this way. Give, and it gives us, to, as we wait for that eternal and future life, it gives us hope and courage to press on and to endure hardship and to avoid giving in to temptation. Keep, as we say at Barclay, keep the and in view. This world is not all, is not all there is. The best is yet to come. Amen? Amen. Be blessed.